So one of the other things that we deal with all of the time in all of our patients that, we, that is, continues to be an important problem um, are pressure ulcers. And we have an expert who's been working on this project for us uh, here at UC Davis now for the past several years. And a lot of progress has been made. So Dr. McGeehan. Thank you very much. So thank you. <clears throat> Let me just test this so I don't have to stand here. Yes, OK. So let me just start by saying that I am starting to hate research. And, you know, my team and I have been working for two years now on trying to tackle the problem of pressure ulcers. And when I signed up for this lecture later in the academic year, I was convinced that by now, March of 2018, I was going to be able to roll out most exciting results of our successful research and all the wonderful experiments that did go the way we had planned. And I am frustrated to say that I can tell you that we have done pretty much weekly experiments for a year and a half that have failed one after the other. And you know, our team logo is, if we knew what we're doing, we wouldn't call it research. Um, but it is quite frustrating at times. So with that, what I have is a lecture that I initially put together in 2012 and presented in this same forum. So if you still remember everything that I said in 2012, feel free to go to Starbucks. Otherwise, we'll have a refresher on uh, pressure ulcers here today. And feel free to interrupt me at any time. We can make this a conversation. There are no conflicts of interest, since we didn't really uh, come up with a solution yet and are not marketing it yet. Maybe next year we'll have significant con <laughs> conflict of interest. And um, there, I think there's one or two pictures that I s stole from the internet, and I will tell you which ones they are. Otherwise, all the patients that I'm showing here today are going to be patients of ours, patients in our community, patients who come and see us here at UC Davis, and some of them at Shriners Hospice for Children. So why should we talk about pressure ulcers? Well, for once, these are the most challenging patients that I see in my practice, and I'll tell you guys why in just a minute. There is generally very poor understanding of what causes them, how they can be prevented, and how they can be treated, both by the patients and by the caretakers, the providers outside that send us these patients with the expectation of surgery, or the providers here who oftentimes don't know how to prevent them, what kind of mattress, what kind of cushion, what kind of ointment, and so on. So hopefully after these next 30 minutes, you guys will all be experts and know exactly how to answer all the questions regarding pressure ulcers. Someone questioned, how can this be one of the more challenging patients that you see in your practice? It's a freaking pressure ulcer. So I looked at what would be considered generally a really, really challenging case, and we did have this poor patient who needed bilateral free flops. And that would be considered by most patients, by most people, like a super challenging patient. But the reality is, we managed this patient for a little over a week. We had to do a very quick workup, a long two sets, of two long surgeries, and then the patient went home, and we actually have lost him to follow up since. Compare that to the workup that is required for a patient who comes with a pressure ulcer like this one here. So this is a real patient who comes to see me, and of course, wants an operation. His primary care doctor is sending him to a plastic surgeon so I can close the ulcer. But the patient doesn't have a clue of how this happened, and therefore doesn't have a clue of how to prevent this from happening again. So if all I do is take him to the operating room, do a flap that I look up in a book, and then close this defect, and you know, yesterday I helped uh, Dr. Mani do one of these cases, and he closed one of these ulcers, and it's easy to do the operation, but it's going to come back. So before we do the operation, we end up spending three to six months with each of these patients and their families, sending letters to their employers and to their school to make sure that they get breaks every two hours, that they have a place where they can rest, that they have the proper equipment, making sure they have the proper nutrition, making sure they're not using alcohol or drugs excessively, making sure that their family is involved, that their transportation has been streamlined, that they have a proper cushion in the car. The list goes on. Because the last thing we want to do is a disservice to our patients. It's easy to sign up a patient like this for an operation and then say, oh, well, it failed six months later when they come back with a recurrence. The problem is, if we did do that, we have now burned their spare part. We have done a true disservice because by taking the tissue that is adjacent to the pressure point and swinging it onto the area of the pressure point, if you haven't spent the time checking off all these dots on page one and all these dots on page two, 
then you are setting up that patient for failure. And I've seen this a lot when I was in training, where patients would get surgeries, they would overcur, and then the patients are blamed. Well, you didn't stay off your ulcer or off, off your butt. It's not that easy. And I think we, as providers, bear the responsibility to educate these patients and make sure all those I's are dotted and all those T's are crossed before we sign them up for an operation. And that's why these patients are so complicated, because you have to spend a lot of time running your mouth with them and with their families to make sure that if we do these surgeries and close this defect, and this is a patient that I operated in 2012, and I've actually seen him like once a year, and he continues to be closed. You know, so six years later, this patient that I spent those six months with continues to have a close uh, pressure ulcer. So that, that is the result that we want to see. And that's why these patients are so challenging. So having said that, what we have to review is the uh, uh, National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel Guidelines and current terminology so we can all speak the same lingo. And a little bit of the advice of the EPUFB, the European equivalent, is included in here as well. Uh, and we're going to also talk a little bit about the, some of the research that we published in the past and the website that still stands and continues to be updated and now has videos, so you guys should look at it once in a while. Um, <laughs> and because I was told to make it short this time, you're all off the hook. We're not going to do the test at the end. But anyone who wants a test on this, we can do it at a later time. So by definition, a pressure also is a localized uh, tissue injury. Uh, that happens um, usually over bony prominence and is always the result of pressure and or shearing. And this is important because there are things that may look like pressure ulcers and are not, and there are some real repercussions in calling something that is not a pressure ulcer a pressure ulcer because of financial repercussions for hospital systems, and we'll talk about them. So if you have a localized injury of the skin due to pressure, she uh, pressure or shearing, that's a pressure ulcer. And they can be classified in many ways. They can be classified by their depth, by their location, and by their etiology. <coughs> Let's start by the depth, which is commonly used. There's going to be different stages or categories. And they depend on how deep things go within the tissue. So look, let's look at examples. You can see a little bit of redness here that doesn't blanch. If you all were to suddenly stand up after this lecture and look at your buttocks, you would have redness on your skin, but it's going to go away after five minutes. Um, but if you have redness that persists and it's maybe painful and tender, oftentimes we see it on the heels. Many times we can miss it on patients who have dark skin pigmentation because the redness is not quite as obvious in them. That is a stage one. This is something that didn't quite destroy the tissue, but it caused enough of an inflammatory reaction that you can see it there. You have this redness that goes away after a few days. If instead what you have is loss of the epidermis, blisters that are still intact or blisters have already sloughed off, now the skin is starting to get destroyed, and this would be considered a stage two. If we go deeper and also include the structure, oh, here's another example of a stage two due to shearing, one of my patients who had surgery not to their heart, surgery to their, out, out to other body parts, I don't remember which body part, and then gets dragged from the operating room table onto the stretcher, and then in recovery they call me and the poor patient looks like this. So we just sheared off the skin on one of my patients, and she now has a stage two uh, pressure ulcer. Again, all of these patients, and some of them look quite impressive, are UC Davis patients. Keep that in mind. These are not internet patients. Um, stage three, if the dermis gets destroyed, now we're looking at subcutaneous tissue. There is no more skin, so something is going to have to be done in order to get that area to heal. And the depth is going to vary with location. I can have a stage three that is several inches deep if it's on a patient who has a lot of padding on their buttocks, or, and I'm still not reaching the bone or the muscle because I'm still in subcutaneous tissue. And I can have a stage four that is only two millimeters deep if it's in an area where we don't, where we don't have much subcutaneous tissue. And then, of course, that brings stage four, and that is one that goes through all layers down to bone, tendon, muscle, deep structures that are deep in the subcutaneous tissue. And finally, we need to talk about unstageables. Unstageables used to be our big hiding spot because threes and fours are reportable. If we destroy the skin in the hospital, somebody comes in without a pressure ulcer at the end of the hospitalization has one, the state wants to know about that. But not if it's just a one or a two. They want to know about threes and fours. 
So for the longest time, we wouldn't have to report all these trees and forests. If more than 50% of the surface of the wound is covered with slough, we don't really know how deep it's going. We know that the surface <coughs> is destroyed, but we don't know if it goes all the way down to bones, so we can't really determine what this is, so it's an unstageable. So we have all these patients that would be sent off to a nursing home with a stage, unstageable pressure ulcer, and then when they would come back from the nursing home, by now the slough had fallen off and would say, oh look, it's a three or a four, but it was of course a nursing home. The state has since smartened up, and now we have to report all threes, all fours, and all unstageables, because they know that an unstageable isn't a one or a two, it's going to be a three or four by definition. So if you cannot see how deep it goes because there is dead slough on top, that's an unstageable. And finally, this is an area of ongoing research, we have this big box called the deep tissue injury. This is skin that clearly has suffered some sort of ischemic or perfusion injury, but it hasn't died yet. It may or may not die. Maybe there are things that we can do to prevent it from dying. Of course, we're not going to subject this skin to ongoing pressure, but there could be other interventions. Maybe a little bit of nitroglycerin paste, or maybe a little bit of extra oxygen, or maybe some hyperbarics. God knows, things that could salvage this area from turning into a full-blown pressure ulcer. So this is an area where most of the research is happening because the understanding is that many of these full-blown pressure ulcers, the stage threes, fours, and stageables, at some point early on may have been a deep tissue injury and that interventions at this stage might change the story and get this area to recoup rather than to die. Don't shoot the messenger. If you see a blister with blood, that's also DTI. It makes no sense to me, but the NPUAP keeps repeating this message year after year. Blood-filled blisters are deep tissue injuries. Okay, what's the differential diagnosis? Well, there's a number of different things that can look like pressure ulcers. This is a burned patient who had all the part of skin burned and excised and then grafted, and the graft didn't take in this area. Well, you could argue, is this really a pressure ulcer? He didn't have skin for starters in that area, you know? So, yeah, it's questionable. And of course, we get dinged, we, the burn team, uh, saying, well, one of your patients had a lot of pressure ulcer. And it's, it's a hard sell to say it's not the way it is. Other patients can show up with maceration from excoriation, dermatitis, if they have copious diarrhea, if there's a lot of drainage in that area, the skin can break down, and it has to be a result of pressure and or shearing to be a pressure ulcer. You know, we've seen a lot of these patients who've got deep crevices, and then at the very top of that crevice, there is an area of maceration and skin breakdown that has never touched the mattress because it's still a lot of padding around it. And then it's being documented like full skin breakdown, it's a pressure ulcer, and we are asked to report that to the state. Well, we shouldn't have to report that. So you really have to make sure to call a spade a spade, but you don't have to call everything that happens to be in the buttock area a pressure ulcer. Every skin breakdown is not one. And, and that's one of the reasons why it's nice to have a wound care team to try to homogenize the nomenclature, to make sure that everyone is on the same page and documenting these events in the same fashion so we don't get un we don't get things unnecessarily. We can also classify pressure ulcers by location. We already said that the majority of them are going to be over bony prominences, so we can start looking around the hospital for breakdown over bony prominences. And we can see one here of the coccyx, and then we can see one of the lateral malleolus and over the epicondyle, and then we can see one from a fravor boot over the Achilles tendon, in the dorsum of the foot, here we can see bilateral ischial pressure ulcers. Here we can see trochanteric pressure ulcers. On top of the ischial pressure ulcers, this is a patient that dutifully was placed on one side or the other to avoid pressure on their buttocks since uh, they had already broken down there. This is a perineal pressure ulcer. Um, this is another sacral pressure ulcer. And another sacral pressure ulcer. The list goes on. We have seen literally hundreds and hundreds of pressure ulcers over the years. Here's an occipital pressure ulcer from C color that was placed tightly and kept in place too long. We've seen them everywhere. This is stolen from the internet. One slide about this. This heart-shaped pressure ulcer is what Nurse Kennedy described over 100 years ago as a Kennedy terminal ulcer. Good old Nurse Kennedy realized that many of her patients just the day or two before they were going to join the Lord, showed up with a heart-shaped pressure ulcer on the buttocks. And that was usually what she realized, a final sign of impending departure. 
And the reason why I think it's still relevant these days, of course, people don't necessarily die the day after having a pressure ulcer, which is clearly a sign of low flow state. I mean, these patients were in shock, the patients that Nurse Kennedy was taking care of. They were not being turned, and they developed these pressure ulcers. And these days with ICU care, people come back from shock, and then they can come to our clinic with these gigantic pressure ulcers, and we can treat them down the road, which is a good thing, you know? But I do think that not every patient who develops a large pressure ulcer necessarily needs to go to the operating room. I do think that sometimes seeing a pressure ulcer should give us at least a moment of reflection and pause to say, where is this patient? Is this patient actively leaving us? And do we still need to take this patient to the operating room or not? So I'm not discouraging treatment. I'm just saying it might be a good moment to pause. And then, and this is the most relevant portion, we can classify them by etiology. Are pressure ulcers community acquired or hospital acquired? Anyone thinks this one, this patient came like this from the community? No. This clearly happened in the hospital. This patient had a tube that was attached too tightly and then ended up with a through and through <laughs> necrosis of the upper lip. So let's talk about hospital-acquired pressure ulcers because these are a big deal. I mean, this is a patient who comes to us with intact tissues who then sustains harm in the hospital. That's horrible. I mean, that's awful. And unfortunately, we see about 20 cases of that every year. Hospital-acquired pressure ulcers are now considered a never event. They're in the same category as cutting off the wrong leg or operating on the wrong patient and the hospitals get fined, and they get reported, and groups that survey outcomes in hospitals can see these reports, and we get dinged for that. There's huge costs associated with them for the care that has to be provided, for the loss of reimbursement that we as a hospital system get if the hospital acquired pressure also prolongs the hospitalization of the patient or makes the patient require additional procedures for treatment of the hospital acquired pressure ulcer, we do not get paid for that. And then of course there is nursing home care or home health care that is somehow imposed on the patients. There is loss of income for these patients. Many of these patients end up not being able to go back to work for months when they have a big <coughs> pressure ulcer. And we are also subject to state fines. So there is real money implications for this. What are the risk factors? We know that the extremes of weight, you know, very skinny and very obese patients, again, one of our 720 pound patients here in the hospital who uh, ended up with multiple pressure ulcers. Um, we know that heating blankets under the patients are a risk factor that's well known. Older patients, patients who are low flow states, hypertension, sepsis, are going to put the patients at high risk for developing a hospital acquired pressure ulcer. Here you can see some examples. This is a, can we lower the lights in the front a little bit? Does anyone know how to do that? Thank you. Um, a patient who came in for cardiac catheterization, and you can see extensive tissue ischemia <coughs> found three days later at the bedside. Here you can see a patient with head and neck surgery, and 12 hours later you can see extensive area of deep tissue injury. Here you can see an infant on ECMO, and we used to see a lot of these injuries because if you've ever seen a baby on ECMO, they have got two garden hoses on their neck, and no one wants to turn them. I certainly don't want to turn them. And they end up with many days of immobility, and the big heavy heads get pressure ulcers. Here you can see a child who had a cast applied that was a little bit too tight. You can see a child that had a feeding tube taped too tightly and had a pressure ulcer on his face. Here you can see an older gentleman who had a feeding tube tied to his nose that was too tight and ended up with necrosis of the skin of the nose. Here you can see a commissure that has been destroyed by pressure. Again, all of these are UC Davis Medical Center patients. Here you can see a trauma patient with probably a number of other, re other comorbidities that ended up with extensive tissue loss. One of our nurses who went for spine surgery and seven hours, or six hours, I'm sorry, of being on her face later, she ended up with a depressed, dimpled chin. You can probably see her walking around and, and recognize her. She's not happy at, about that at all. Um, a gentleman with thoracic surgery, trauma patient, another patient with DTIs. The list goes on. 
Let me just skip over a couple of these. Okay. I presented this slide before, and it's unfortunately still relevant today. Back then, we published a paper of three consecutive years looking at every single hospital fire pressure also in our hospital system. And the vast majority, I forget, it's 96, 97% of them were patients that had surgery. Now, this hospital does not have 97% of surgical patients, so we're getting an uh, this, uh, a large number of our patients in surgery uh, with pressure ulcers. And back then I hypothesized that maybe the issue is that all the mean nurses are signing up for the surgical floors, and they just don't like turning the patients, you know? But that's probably not the reason. The reason is probably that all these patients are subjected to immobility and low flow state, maybe hypotension, maybe hypothermia, for many hours during their hospitalization. And that usually happens in the operating room. And then we can see them a week or two later with these areas of breakdown. So it's something that we surgeons need to recognize so we can then, as part of our time out pause, when we say, okay, is everything okay for this patient to do surgery? We should also make sure that we think about pressure ulcers because 97% of the pressure ulcers in this hospital happen to surgical patients. So if you have a patient that's going to be immobilized for six hours face down, you want to maybe say, listen, guys, it's going to take me six hours. Can we take a break? Can we give the face a break after two hours and do something, reposition the patient, and so on? We cannot blame anesthesia for this. We certainly cannot blame the nurses for this, because if it was nursing causing all these pressure ulcers, we should see a lot of patients in the medicine wards with breakdowns as well. So if most of the patients are surgery patients, I think we have to look inside in, and, and, and think about ways of preventing these. So what can we do? Well, the NPUAP gives us a couple of recommendations, and I think they all work. I'm just going to briefly glance over them. Moisture control. Wet skin breaks down easily. You put your patient in diapers. No one ever looks underneath the diapers. They're going to be completely macerated. They're going to break down. Don't put them in diapers. Put them on a chuck with just a gown on top. Skin barriers, there's a number of them. We use Cavillon here, which is a skin film. It's like silicone. You can paint them on the patient's buttocks if they're going to be uh, on, on a wet surface or in the same spot for a prolonged period of time. Reduce friction and shearing. The preferred um, uh, product that we have here at UC Davis is called Mepilex Border. It works fantastically well. You don't see those shearing injuries like I showed earlier. I just put one of those protective pads on the patient before. Avoid foam rings or donuts that work like a tourniquet by cutting off the circulation from all directions at the same time. And do, whenever possible, pressure relief. Turn the patients after a while. Even if you're in the operating room, take a break, change positions, do something. So um, assess, identify the patients that are at risk is the other recommendation that the NPUAP gives us. We do have, of course, the Braden scale, which is a scale that has six different parameters, things like how is their nutrition, how is their mobility, how is their consciousness, and so on. And it's widely known and published. It doesn't really apply to the surgical <coughs> patients because all of the patients in surgery are going to be with immobility, are going to be with unconsciousness, and so on. So maybe we need a new perioperative risk assessment scale that one of our residents can come up with. Um, we certainly don't know how to identify these patients perfectly yet, and that's why we see 20 injuries every year. Again, the risk factors are known, some of them anyway, and here are the recommendations. Keep the patients dry, we've got the super absorbent thin air chucks everywhere. Protect the skin, we've got the cavalon everywhere. Avoid friction, we've got the methylex border everywhere. Avoid tourniquet surfaces, like the rings. Sometimes there have been successful things. <coughs> Remember that ECMO baby that I showed you guys? One of the NICU nurses thought of using this. It's a little beanie cushion. It has like little beans inside it. And she said, what if we put the heads of the babies on this bean pillow and squish on one end or the other of the bean pillow every hour just to shift the beans around? Haven't seen a single ECMO baby with a pressure ulcer in five years. So there are solutions out there. I don't have them, but hopefully you guys will come up with them, and then we'll fix these problems. Um, there's always the question of what mattress should we be using. And this is something that bothered me forever, because all the nurses assume 
that a plastic surgeon would have gotten training that would tell him or her what mattress and what you know pillows to use for these patients. And we have no clue. We certainly didn't get a single moment of training in that, so you guys are getting it now. So there is big variability. The cost varies between $400 to $13,000 for the mattresses around the hospital. Every single vendor is going to tell you that their mattress is the best. Theirs has foam, theirs has air, <coughs> theirs has beans, their gels, memory, you name it. <laughs> Mobility, multiple chambers, the list goes on. So we tested every single service that we could find. We took healthy volunteers that we divided into two categories. Thin volunteers and not thin volunteers. And we had <laughs> both volunteer groups <coughs> sit and lie on top of every single surface that support surface that we could find. We started with the stretchers at the ambulances that were coming into the hospital and went all the way to the ICU to the rotating machine. So, you know, we went cray cray, did over 400 measurements. We published this series. This is actually one of our thin volunteers on two different surfaces. And you can see how in one surface, which is a regular hospital mattress, there is a real hot spot identified over the sacrum, on the picture on the right. The uh, pressures here exceeded 50 millimeters of mercury. On a different support surface, the pressures are hot. So the support, sur support surface matters. Now, even the very, very best support surface is going to have pressures that are going to exceed the capillary flow pressure. So even if you find the best one in the whole hospital, you still have to turn your patient once in a while. But hopefully you're not causing quite as effective of a tourniquet effect on those tissues here by compressing them harshly, but instead only putting mild pressure on them. And the key is that the better surfaces are going to distribute the weight over a broader area. And what we found was the winner was anything that's air-filled or water-filled. Because if you put the weight of your bony prominence on an air-filled support surface, it sinks in, displacing the air to pop up on the rest of it. And then the pressure is even anywhere your body is touching that air-filled mattress, you're going to have the same pressure. Try to focus the weight of your body on just one bony prominence when you're lying on an air-filled mattress that's underinflated. It's impossible. Therefore, you're going to distribute the whole weight of your body <coughs> over a broader area, and you're going to have lower peak pressures, hopefully less of a complete occlusion of flow, less of a tourniquet effect, less ischemia, less injury, less pressure ulcers. So the EHOP, which I pedal like I'm getting money for it, I should, but no, um, <laughs> is really the winner. And it's a dirt cheap alternative. It doesn't cost $12,800. It costs like 60 bucks for the whole, uh, for the whole bed overlay. And we use it in the burn ICU like it's going out of fashion. In the operating room, it wasn't quite so successful. I tried to bring the EHOP into the operating room. We tried it on a couple of surgeries. The problem is twofold. You cannot x-ray through it. And then when we were changing the positions into, uh, of the table into like Trendelenburg or lateralized, they would slide off. So that wasn't such a happy day. So we're not really recommending the EHOP for the operating room, but for anywhere else. Uh, in the operating room, uh, the wound care team got a grant, and uh, we got one of these um, dolphin uh, mattresses, it's the coolest mattress ever. It was actually made to transport orphan baby dolphins on land. So you can put a baby dolphin on it, and it just thinks it's on the ocean. And I've, I've lied on it, and it's like the best thing ever. It just has the motion of the ocean, and I would like one for home, but they're like $25,000 a piece. But we do have one of those. So if you're planning on like a 20-hour cray cray surgery, ask for the dolphin. We have it available, and you can x-ray through it, okay? Now, how do we treat these pressure ulcers? How do we go from there to there? Well, we're running out of time, but we have the intranet. And on the intranet, we have every single product that's been approved by our hospital. We have pictures, we have costs, we've got instructions, and on some of them, we've got videos. So if you want to know what the options are for treatment, the bottom line is wounds like to be clean and moist. But if you want to know which products to recommend, go to the internet, put in the uh, keyword wound, and you will find it. And there is lots of information that's constantly being updated by our team in there. Um, surgery. 
There's two types of surgeries, and we're finishing with this. You can do acute debridements at the bedside. Don't do it if you didn't check the coagulation, please. I've had at least a half a dozen occasions so far in the last 10 years where I got called to see a big puddle of blood because an eager resident went to sniff up carefully all the dead tissue and never realized that the patient was anticoagulated. So don't do that. Short of that, if there is dead crap hanging off the patient and smelling in the hallway and you've got a mask, go cut it off carefully. Don't make the patient please. Don't make them hurt either. If you're hurting them, you're going too deep. You're only supposed to snip off the dead debris. So it should be a pain-free procedure. And then the other thing to do in surgery is, of course, to close it, like the case that Dr. Mani closed yesterday in the operating room. These are never small cases. You look at a patient like this, and it looks like a smallish ulcer, but what you're forgetting is that this is contracted from its original large defect, and there's a lot of scar tissue, and you cannot suture capsule against capsule. You've got to get rid of it first. You've got to do a capsulectomy. So these are always cases that look small, but then when you've done the, the excision of the capsule, you have a big-ass defect. Pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to close this big-ass defect, and that always requires a big-ass flap. And, and here you can see an example of a big-ass flap. And then you close them, and hopefully you've done your homework by spending those three to six months seeing the patient every other week in the clinic to make sure that all those I's are dotted and all those T's are crossed. So you can say, like this patient, I did the surgery six years ago, she still doesn't have a recurrence because she knows what to do because we spend the time educating the patient, which is a huge pet peeve of mine that people would do these surgeries without spending that time. And that was the last slide. Questions? That's great. Enjoyed that that summary because it affects all of our, our all of us here in surgery. But one thing I just noticed in one of your slides, you mentioned to avoid the sheepskin. And I, I'm an old surgeon, and I'm just wondering, you know, you, know, you have the patients lying in bed. You, you, I, I still ask for sheepskin skin boots, uh, mea culpa. What what should I be? Looking there is no evidence to show that it helps. So you're you're probably not hurting your patients, but the NPUT certainly doesn't think that they're that they should be recommending them because there was no evidence proving that it does help. It may help with preventing of shearing. I certainly do not believe that it helps with pressure redistribution in any meaningful way. And one other question. A lot of the times after you have a patient that's, that's been you know, intubated for a while, a week or two, all of a sudden now you start putting, you know, they start moving bed to chair, and it's good, you know, obviously most cardiac, if they're sitting up, and their bones get sore. What should we be asking for that same e hop comes as a chair cushion. It comes in every size. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, how do we compare to other hospitals? Because I can't imagine that other hospitals really figured it out either. Or are we an outlier? No, no, we're actually doing better than the average um, hospital out there. I think in part what makes us look better now is that we have a more homogeneous um, system to identify the true hospital fire pressure ulcer. Before, if anyone out there on the ward said this is a pressure ulcer, it was being reported, we're reporting a whole lot of stuff that didn't need to be reported, including things that were coming from the community or things that were happening here but weren't really a pressure ulcer. And I think that it's important to have you know, the same team evaluate each of these ulcers every time to make sure that we properly uh, designate those that we need to report as such. And I think that you should not be so modest and take credit for the good work that having this unified team has done uh, in the institution to help actually identify the patients, to help do some of these projects to treat things, and to help educate all of us. I mean, I think that you're, we, for better or worse, are now getting referrals for treatment of some of these complex wounds and patients because of the uh, expert work that your large group um, has been doing. So. Thank you. It's an important contribution. All right. Okay. So thanks, Thank everybody.